Okay. Um, so Henrietta, you ready? Yes, I'm ready to go. Okay, great. So it's yeah, great to have Henrietta to give the third lecture in this series. Take it away. All right. So, uh, so this lecture has to do with divergent soft limits. We talked about the vanishing soft limits and how we could bootstrap effective field trees using those limits. But in this case, we're going to talk about this part that was basically be negative sigma in this weight characterization we gave in the first lecture. So I want to show you some very fundamental cool stuff that comes out from studying these uh, divergent soft limits. So let's go back to your quantum field theory class where you may have learned about photon IR divergences in, in the context of QED. So suppose you have some photon like this one here, and uh, you have a particular diagram that of course many diagrams that contributes to an end particle process, but let's this photon interact with something that could be an electron or a positron or some charged particle. And then you can see that the contribution from this diagram is something that has a factor of this form here, Q, K, is the charge that is associated with this electron or positron that sits there. So in some units, it's plus minus one. And then there's a polarization for the, the, the particle that we're going to take soft, the photon. And it's dotted into the momentum of the electron and it divided by PS dot K, which is basically coming from the momentum of the propagator. So this is basically the propagator term that sits here. So that is PS plus K squared in the limit where of course uh, the external states are on shell. So S squared and K squared are both zero. Now you see that as you take PS to zero, the momentum of the photon, this factor that sits in front of the diagram will be dominating what you get from this diagram. And that gives you the divergence. So the, the logic here is that when I take the momentum of the photon to zero, the propagator will go on shell because this is just a free particle vertex. So it becomes basically K and K squared is zero. So that propagator goes on shell and that's where the divergence come from. And you see it directly because here in the denominator is a factor of PS. And so of course, as that goes to zero, this blows up. So, then in quantum field theory classes, you talk about photon IR divergences, and you talk about how well they sit there in individual diagrams, they sit there in the scattering amplitudes. But once you compute the cross section and take the loops and their IR divergences into account, everything nicely cancels and can give you finite cross sections. So in this lecture, I won't worry about the cross sections. I'll think about those. We'll just think about the amplitudes themselves. And a similar case, a similar thing is, is true about soft limits for gluons, not just for photons, but also for gluons, as we can see by looking at the Park Taylor amplitudes that I gave you for gluons last time. So here I chose lines one and two to be the negative helicity states. And the amplitude is then the cyclic product of angle brackets in the denominator and an angle one, two to the fourth in the numerator. Now I want to take the momentum of particle S that I chose to have positive velocity, I want to take it soft. So I scale my momentum by an effect of epsilon. But now we know spin a helicity formalism and I know that my momentum is an S angle times uh, S squared. And so I should think about how I'm actually going to do this soft limit in terms of spin helicity variables, because after all, that's what my Park Taylor amplitude is ex expressed in terms of. So should I scale in option one, the square brackets, or should I scale in option two, the angle brackets, or should I do some hybrid where, for example, I scale with square root epsilon for both of them? What this comes down to is a little group ambiguity, because we know little group scaling is something that scales the angle and the squares of a particle oppositely. And so these different choices are just equivalent by a little group scaling. But it turns out that there's one choice that is more convenient than the other ones. And that's choice number two. So this is be what we'll do. And the reason is this. If I go with choice one and I scale my, my square brackets, then you see that Park Taylor only depend on angle brackets. So the result of that would be an order one in epsilon. It will not detect the divergence that we know should be there because just like for photons, there'll be factors that come from this from, from, from diagrams that has this kind of cubic interaction. 
So it doesn't probably detect the divergence if you use option one. And in option three, well, there's more to keep track of if I don't both want to scale the angles and the squares. And we go for a minimal principle here. And by the way, who wants to deal with square root epsilons anyway? So we will go with option two, namely that we'll scale for a positive helicity particles to take the soft limit, we scale the angles. And again, this is just a technical choice. There's nothing fundamental in it, except this is very practical. Okay, so I scale my angles and I don't scale my squares. That gives me a limit where PS goes to zero when epsilon goes to zero. And then I go and I look at my Puck Taylor amplitude and I see that there are two places in the numerator that contained S. So these are just the last factors in the cyclic trace here or the cyclic product. And so I pull that out from the rest and then I multiply and divide by a factor of angle N1. Why do I do that? I do that because then the entire remaining part over here is exactly an N particle amplitude. So what it shows is that I get a factor that is one over epsilon squared, one epsilon for each of the two S angle brackets. I get something that encaptures the soft factor and then this multiplies an N particle amplitude. So it's basically as if you remove the soft particle from the amplitude and you're left with an amplitude with one less leg times a soft factor that encodes the fact that something, something happened. So by the way, a little exercise for you guys to do if you want to get your hands dirty, which you really should, is to connect this soft factor that I wrote here to the expression that I gave you from photons, which is also valid for gluons, and try to make the connection between this and that expression. It requires a little calculation and some of the techniques you saw last time. Okay, questions, comments? Please interrupt at any time. And I see that there's a question in the chat. If I'm making distinction between collinear and soft divergences, I'm not thinking about collinear divergences at all. I'm not taking S to be parallel with K, for example, or specific K. I'm just scaling the soft, uh, the, the particle I want to take soft, I'm just scaling its momentum to zero. So I'm, I'm not doing a I'm, I'm just kind of I'm just kind of hallucinating about all the QCD lectures I've seen and I'm thinking yes. about you know summing these guys up and I'm trying to put you in context. Right. I'm, so, I'm perfectly I'm perfectly happy looking at this because I'm you know the word effective you know equivalent photon approximation are screaming at me right now which of course is written down right here. Right. So so so, so maybe maybe see at the end where where we are going with this because you you'll see how these are definitely soft limits, um, and I'll keep them separate from the collinear story. But but of course there are connections. So um, can can I can I can I hold the words Weizsäcker Williams in my head also? Sorry, say that again. Can I can I keep the words Weiss and Williams in my head also? You can keep. Anything you like in my head, in your head, <laughs> but okay, you have good. to maybe explain it to me afterwards, please. Okay, good. <laughs> good. All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so more generally, I have written out here some soft theorems, and and this may be something that that Thomas also recognized um, for sure. That these are the soft theorems, um, and that sort of underlies a lot of the modern. Uh, applications of soft theorems that has occurred. So let me try to explain what we got here. So here again, I'm taking a soft particle, a particle to be soft. I take its momentum soft, and we talked about photons already. And there are soft theorems that say that amplitudes with photons behave in a universal in a universal way when a photon is taken soft. In particular, it has that one over epsilon squared divergence that I just showed you for blue ones that sits in the photon too. And that soft photon factor, that S zero that I denoted here in spinner helicity language takes this form here. Now, where did that come from? Well, I told you already that there was a factor like this that came from basically Feynman rules and the denominator from the propagator. If I convert exact expression here for a positive helicity for, this, for the photon into the spinner helicity formalism that I introduced last time, then you have this part here that comes from the polarization. Then there's the K, this was this K that was dotted in. Then there's the PS.K, let's give that a different color, this part here, that sits there in spinner helicity language. And 
Then there's the X that appears in this expression. This X here that appears is simply this equivalent of the Q I gave you last time, which encoded the gauge choice of the polarization, of the polarization vector. So X is arbitrary as long as it's not S. And then when you simplify this out, you see that the SK squares will actually cancel and you're left with exactly this expression, which is what sits here. And then you have to sum over the case. So that's what that overall soft factor is. And that multiplies the endpoint amplitude similar to what you saw with the Park Taylor amplitude. But what is very interesting is also that there's a subleading soft theorem, a one over epsilon type term. And that also takes a form that, that I haven't written down here, which is, which is in a sense universal in that it's, it's basically something that has to do with the angular momentum operator and so it's a derivative operator that acts on the amplitude. And then in effective field theory context, there can also be another subleading term, which I won't go into too much detail about, uh, but it sits there. Similarly, for gravitons, there's a leading soft factor, which has a similar expression to that for the photon, except now instead of the charge being there, that's the overall gravitational coupling, there's something that basically looks like a momentum of SK. So that is that you can think of as gravity couples to energy, right? This is the Mandelstam variable that basically sits here. This is actually an S, SK, so to speak. And then there's something that looks like this polarization stuff over here squared. And we've seen a little bit of a hint already that Yang Mills is something, Yang Mills squared, or is somehow related to gravity squared. So maybe it's not surprising that this kind of looks like energy coupled to the photon soft theorem squared. Very heuristic, but, but it sort of has that spirit. So that's the leading soft graviton theorem. And that comes from in our way of taking the soft limit where I scale the angles and not the squares, this comes as an one over epsilon cubed. This was found by Weinberg already in 65 in a famous paper. Why did he do it? Well, as he says in the paper, in his paper, he says explicitly, I do it because I can't. And he had some other reasons too. But he does say that statement. Then there are sub subleading soft theorems too that were found much more recently in 2014 by Cachasso and Strominger. And they also take a certain universal form. And all of this then acts on the endpoint amplitude of the graviton. And in effective field theory context, there are certain cases that can also give you contributions at one over epsilon. Now, some of you might have heard about things like celestial amplitudes and connections between the soft theorems and the BMS group at null infinity and so on. All of that story, arises from these sub sub, the subleading soft graviton theorem and the whole structure of soft graviton theorems as you can derive from these stories. And this is, this is something you can look up in the papers by Strominger and Cachasso. I put one of the a reference to lecture notes by Strominger in to the reference file. So you can see it there. How do you okay. distinguish between A and tilde and A and, and like, how do you distinguish between them? They, they look the same. Like, Sorry, one more, one more time. How do you distinguish between a n and a n tilde? Uh, ah, like so so a n has the same external states as a n plus one when the soft line is removed, but a tilde and m tilde those mean that the k state that you can have the that the line that connects to the soft part can be different. So these guys can actually have different external states than the other ones. That's that's the distinction between them. And so these, these subleading soft theorems, both for photons and, and gravitons that, that modify these, these are related to effective field theory operators. And these were actually found uh, just a about five years ago with a st my student, Callum Jones, and our collaborator, Stephen Schulich. And there are actually also papers by Sen and Latka and others that put these kind of soft theorems into context of string theory and D dimensions and so on. So nice set of papers. Okay. So there, there are also in the, in the reference that I give you, there are expressions for these subleading factors, but, but we won't need them for today. So the goal of the lectures today is to derive a master formula from which all the results above can be derived, all these soft theorems, as well as soft theorems for other particles. In particular, any kind of divergent soft theorem in any context of effective field theory in four dimension can be derived from that master formula. So it's a 4D master formula. But then 
the reason I want to show you this is also is, is twofold. One is that it illustrates a very powerful tool that is very often used in amplitudes, both for deriving recursion relations and for many other things. And that is the idea that we, of course, typically for scattering processes, we would want real momentum, but it's actually very powerful to continue the momentum for mathematics for, for the derivation purposes into the complex plane. So you basically deform the momentum in certain ways. And that's an extremely powerful tool combined with complex analysis. And so I want to illustrate that. And that's part of what goes into the derivation of this formula. And then the second point is that this master formula, not only does it give rise to all the divergent solve theorems that we can possibly have in any field theory or effective field theory context, it also gives you some very fundamental constraints on scattering and, 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 and properties of quantum field theories that you probably heard about, but you may never have seen a proof of. So let me give you some examples of what these are. So one is that we can derive the equivalence principle from a GR in, in GR in an amplitude context. So what does this mean? It, it's basically an amplitude version of saying that different objects all fall equally in the same gravitational field. Another statement that you have probably heard at some point is that you are not allowed to have higher spin massless particles interacting with gravitons or things with lower spin in flat space. And that statement is, is sometimes made like, okay, we should just consider up to, to spin two, the gravitons, don't think about spin five halves, don't think about spin three, that doesn't exist in flat space. In, in curved space, it's a different matter, but in flat space, you can't have it. And we can prove from this master formula, that particular statement. Well, that's very, that's a very nice outcome. So this is one thing I want to show you. And then another statement you might have heard about is that when you have gravitinos and you try to make them interact, there's only, there's one thing that you always must have. And that is that gravitinos must couple to gravity. And the only way they're allowed to couple is in the way that preserves supersymmetry. So you could play around with Lagrangians and write down where it's a swing of fields and see that they always must couple to gravity and this sort of stuff, but it leaves the question open like, but, but would have been something else I could have done at the Lagrangian level, what if, what if? And here we'll, we can actually see that this, this must happen. So I may not be able to show this to you today, but that is an outcome also of this master formula. Okay, questions? Uh, yeah, I, I had a question. So um, when you uh, were discussing the uh, soft graviton and soft photon theorem, uh, yeah, uh, do we, so the graviton theorem involves both uh, angle and square bracket, right? So do we yes. scale both the angle and the square brackets here? to get? So, so the rule will be that whenever I take a positive helicity particle soft, and I, that's what I'll do in this entire lecture, I will scale it, oopsies. I will scale it in, in this particular way here that I only scale the angles. If I were to take a negative, I mean, I'm and I'm only doing one soft limit at a time. So if I were to do it for a negative velocity particles, everything I say today will be the same except you interchange angles and squares. And in particular there, I would change to take the, soft, the square brackets soft instead of the angles. But, but yes, the, the amplitudes with gravitons and amplitudes that are not in the MHV sector, um, will depend both on angles and squares in general. But I still only take the angle soft when I have a positive velocity photon or graviton. Um, a, a related question to that. So I guess when Weinberg derived the soft graviton theorem, he didn't think of it in terms of uh, spinner helicity, right? That's right. Yeah, so is it, I mean, do we do it afterwards to match with the soft graviton theorem that he derived? That oh, excellent. So, so when I wrote this soft factor here for the graviton and spinner helicity, that was literally taking the expression from Weinberg's paper and plugging in polarizations and, and momenta and spinner helicity formalism, and then you can rewrite it into this form. And, yeah, and, and then we take the soft limit in a way so that it reproduces the uh, Weinberg's formula. In, in other uh, words, oh, we oh, take so, the so soft I, limit. It turns out I don't, have a, I don't have a choice. When I take the soft limit, I, it turns out I must get this leading soft theorem. There's no oh, other so choice. It doesn't depend on whether we take the limit on angle bracket or square bracket. No, it, it doesn't. The, the, those are really equivalent up to little group scaling, but I'm doing the thing that is, is most convenient for the easiest derivation, basically. 
And, and if you did something else, the powers of epsilon that you would have would change. But, but in this way of doing it, I'm sort of maximizing the divergences, which means that I can get all these subleading solve theorems as divergent pieces, not as order one pieces, which turn out to be more difficult. The idea is that having poles and epsilon is going to be the convenient thing that allows me to use complex analysis to extract these results, as you'll see. Cool. All right, so let's go and try to derive that master formula. So it's a little bit of a long derivation, but I'm going to break it into steps so that at each step you can sort of see the key part. And so the first step, so, so what I mean here is now let's go and derive the master formula. So step one is our intuition. Our intuition is that the divergences come when I take a particle soft and some propagator inside a diagram will go on shell. And that exactly happens whenever I have a cubic interaction. So the intuition is that divergent terms arise from cubic interactions. And they only arrive from cubic interactions. If I had some four particle interaction like this, and I take one line soft, the internal line doesn't go on shell when my other moments are generic as I will shoot, assume that they are. So this, this diagram here would be order epsilon to the zero. There couldn't be, it couldn't possibly a divergent piece arising from it. So again, the soft part comes from basically this type of term here. Okay, now this is very nice because we know a lot about cubic interactions because we know they're on shell matrix elements. And so in particular, when I take a soft limit, basically I would get something that looks like a free particle amplitude if I can take the limit in a smart way that doesn't take the this momentum all soft, but if I can sort of go into the complex plane a little bit and put the internal line here on shell, then I can get an expression where these type of diagrams dominate. Let me, let me this, is, this is a little abstract, but, but I'll explain that in detail. So we know the three particle amplitudes very well because we know for mathless particles, they're uniquely determined on spin helicity formalism. And that was one of the things we saw last time. So they're uniquely determined in the spin helicity formalism. And this indeed will come in and we'll use it. But then we fig have to figure out how to take the soft limit. So basically what I want to try to do is figure out a way of taking the internal line here on shell while not having my photon completely soft, so epsilon still a little bit away from zero, such that I can use my factorization on the pole and then take the soft limit and extract information. This allows me to utilize the fact that we know the three particle amplitudes very well. Okay, so I imagine, I, I, I want to take my soft momentum to zero, right? So I want to take this soft, but I want on every step along the way to keep my on-shell properties. So I want to keep all the particles on-shell. And preserve momentum conservation. But this is of course tricky because in the limit where epsilon is zero, I must have that the sum of all the other momenta of the n other particles is zero. In other words, I need to have that this property here holds. This must be zero. So how can I, for epsilon not quite zero, keep momentum conservation? And the answer is that we deform the momenta by taking 
new momenta that we will call PS hat and K hat. And these will be on shell, so I can write them in terms of spinohelicity variables. Like that. And then the question is, how do I do this? So I want this to be such that the sum of all the PK hats to N plus PS hat is equal to zero. That's how for any epsilon even greater than or bigger to zero, I can get zero. So I know already how I want to deform my momentum S. I want S hat to be epsilon S because I'm assuming that my soap particle is positive elicity. And I want S square to just be unchanged. But then how can I keep the other particles on, on shell? What I do is that I choose two particular lines, I and J in the set from one to N. And I'll deform those two lines too. And the answer won't depend physically on which ones I choose. I'll just choose two. And then I set the angle brackets of those to be unchanged, but I'll deform the square brackets in a way such that momentum conservation is preserved for all epsilon. How do I do it? Well, let me show you. I Can you explain? I, uh, I'm quite I'm a bit confused. Uh, like yes, why can't, sorry, uh, what is the problem? Like, by, like when you write down, uh, these momenta in the in this spinner helicity form, they're already on shell, right? So they're, they're the already on shell, but they don't necessarily satisfy momentum conservation. Why? So why? the point is that at epsilon equal to zero, the n particles by themselves must satisfy momentum conservation. So as soon as I take epsilon a little bit away from zero, I also have my PS, and that will not satisfy momentum conservation along with the other ones. So therefore, I deform them a little bit in order to achieve that. It will depend on epsilon now. Like PK will exactly. also depend they on epsilon. They will now depend a little bit on epsilon through the following way of writing them. I see. Okay. Thanks. So I will, good. Very good. So yes, you'll see exactly how this works. I'll deform the square bracket a little bit by a square bracket S times a certain factor. And I'll explain why that factor is what it is. So this is an S. Okay, so this is, this is how I deform the particles. And then what I wanted was, I wanted that the sum over all K equals one through N of the shifted momenta plus that of the S. Now I want this to be zero for all epsilon. And that's what I can achieve by having deformed the I's and the J's. So from these first parts here, these being unshifted, I will get that all the case then remain on, oh, sorry, here. This, there's the unshifted part that is just zero. And then there's a part that depends on epsilon. And what is that part? It's epsilon times, and let's start with the thing that came from S. So S angle S square, that's PS minus then this part that comes from the angled deform. So, so the square deform. So that gives me JS angle divided by JI times S square minus J times IS. And this is from this part here over angle IJ times square S. And that's the whole thing. Okay, this has a common square bracket S in it. So if I look at everything that is in here, this becomes a square S, I can take that outside, divided by, let's pull out an angle IJ. Then I get S times angle IJ minus, well, I actually get plus because I have to reverse the order here. So I get plus, angle I times JS. And then from the last term, I will also reverse these two lines. 
so that I get plus J times angle SI. And now you see, if you read for each, each term cyclically, I have SIJ, SIJ, SIJ. This is exactly the Scouten identity. So this whole thing is zero by the Scouten identity I showed you yesterday, the statement that three two component vectors must be linearly dependent. Okay, so this whole epsilon dependence was zero and I actually achieved what I wanted by this shift that I have my momentum conservation preserved. Question. Uh, is there any sum over I or J in this? There's not a sum over I and J. I and J was a choice I made of two lines that I'm treating differently from the other ones. And I can make any choice uh, between the, the one through N lines. It's just a trick to keep everything on shell, but it's a very useful trick. So now if I compute my P hat, KS, this is the momentum that runs in my diagram with my soft line attached to any kind of K line. This has momentum PKS. And now we shifted everybody, so this has a hat. So I want to figure out when this thing has poles. And I can plug in, and no matter which of the Ks I use, I will find that this, well, it's KS. Let me write it out first. K hat, S hat. And because the change in I and J were proportional to S, then when I dot it in with S, nothing happens because a square bracket S with itself vanishes. So this simply becomes an overall epsilon that came from here times KS, KS. But here's a little thing that is tricky. What I wanted was a way for each K of putting the internal line on shell and you see that the way I can do this is that the only way this can be on shell, this is only zero when epsilon goes to zero. That means that the poles for all the different diagrams that factorize in this cubic way, all these different diagrams, will have the poles located in the same place. And that's kind of unfortunate because then I can't use them as simple poles where I can easily extract the residues. So I want, to move each PKS equal zero on shell condition a bit away from epsilon equals zero. So in order to do this, I'm going to use another trick, which is I'm going to do one further deformation of the particles. So here is, is what we'll do will introduce a new complex parameter Z, that's some complex number. And then I'm going to write S hat, not just as epsilon S, but I'm going to shift it a little bit because that way I'm going to shift the poles that I'm going to show you. But now that I've shifted S by some amount that depends on Z, I also have to compensate for that to get momentum conservation. And so then momentum conservation requires that I similarly shift two other lines and I can do it with the same I and J. So let me go up here and steal my expressions. And I'll do it in a way that is very parallel to what we had before. I'll do the same thing, but now I'm adding an additional part that depends on C, an additional shift in variables that is very parallel to what we did before, except with X replacing S. And now momentum conservation for the shifted very momentum variables will hold. And it will hold by exactly the same argument that I just showed you, because everything I did was the same with X and S interchanged and epsilon going to minus C. Okay, so this here is going to be my kinematics. This will define my kinematics. And what is the use of this? Well, now, when I look at the internal momentum P hat KS squared, I have KS hat and hat. 
and k hat s. Now I can remove the hat from the s square and from the angle k because there will never be one. And what you end up with is then epsilon times ks, just as before. But now there's the term that depends on z that comes from the shift in s hat. And that will now have k times x. And this multiply ks, because I can also remove the hat there, because it's dotted into s. And now I can write this as epsilon minus epsilon k times pks unshifted squared, where epsilon k is z times kx divided by ks. So what's the point? Let me try to draw a picture of what we have now. So here is my complex epsilon plane. And before I had all my poles located at epsilon equal to zero, but now I've moved them away. By having a non-zero z, I'm shifting them off that I have epsilon one there, maybe epsilon two there, epsilon three here at some other point, and epsilon uh, n, et cetera, up there. And we'll be working in a regime where my z is less than epsilon, which is much less than one. So we're looking at small epsilon and even smaller z in such a way that what I'm interested in to extract the divergent part of the amplitudes, the epsilon divergent part, is a small region around the origin here. So I'm looking at a small region here. And in that small region, I know exactly how to compute the residues on each one of these poles, because I know that on each one of the poles, they correspond to an internal probable beta going on shell into a cubic amplitude and an n particle amplitude. And then I can extract a lot of information from that. So on each pole, so on each of these poles, I have factorization. And the key point is that I can factorize on each of these poles a little bit away from zero. And once I know an expression there, I know those are the only pieces in the amplitude that can possibly give me an epsilon divergence. So then I can take epsilon to zero while pushing t to zero, and I can extract the divergences that way. And they have factorization into A3 times a e n. So this gives me step number three in the process. Excuse me, can I ask you a question? Yes, of course. I think I didn't really understand why it is important to move away the poles from the origin. Can you repeat that, please? Yes, so um, going back to the diagram that we know gives the UV divergences, I know that if I take the internal line here on shell, that means P is K, if I take it on shell, this will factorize into a free particle amplitude that I have control over because I know what all of them are, times some leftover n particle amplitude. And that is very much in the spirit of what the soft theorems look like. They look like some factor times an n particle amplitude. But the problem is when all these, when, when all these poles get stacked up on, on top of each other, I can't figure out which part belongs to k and which one k equals one and which part belongs to k equals two, which part belongs to k equals three. But when I separate off the poles, I can calculate the residues on each of these poles, which correspond exactly to such a diagram here. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Great. So, so basically now we look at a given pole and, or we can say near the pole, near each pole. So I, I look at one particular pole, K, and I look in a small neighborhood and you can think about doing a Cauchy type of theorem in that neighborhood. Or I can simply express my n plus one particle amplitude as something that contains a part that will be a shifted because it depends on S and, and on epsilon. And so this depends on Z and epsilon. So it depends on a shifted amplitude. This, this picks up exactly the part with S and K and then the endpoint stuff. So it has the free particle amplitude with S and K and the internal momentum. 
times some n particle amplitude with line k being special. And this must be then divided by pk s squared. And here in the numerator up here, in order to write this, I must have taken pk on shell. So in this expression, pk s squared is taken to be on shell, which is equivalent to saying that epsilon is epsilon k. So I basically pick up the one contribution to the amplitude that has this vector adjacent channel, and I pick it up uniquely. And the power of this is that there are no other diagrams that can contribute to the amplitude. So a n plus one will be a sum over these poles, epsilon k with k equals one through n. Of this type of expression, let me steal it from up here. Like that. Plus, the only other thing that can be here is order epsilon to the zero. This is the only thing that can give me a UV, that, uh, sorry, that can give me an infrared divergence because everything else would be order epsilon. And that's really all I care about. So in other words, what I benefited from here is that if I think of the small region around the origin that surrounds all the poles, then I can pick up the residues at all of these poles and add them up and I know that in the limit where epsilon goes to zero, these are the only places that can give me divergences in epsilon. And therefore I can determine the entire divergent part of the amplitude as epsilon goes to zero from this. Okay, so that's the first step of, of doing the factorization. But then I need to worry about what each of these pieces are. So from what we had before, I know that this propagator part is something I can write as epsilon times one minus z over epsilon. I'm just factorizing out epsilon, kx over ks. And you might be worried that I'm writing things with one over epsilons here and I want to take epsilon to zero, but this turns out to be a, a very nice way of writing it. And this is, this is just the same as epsilon minus epsilon k times pks squared. And here I still need my pks squared also. Um, the only other part I really need to worry about is what sits inside the free particle amplitude. And free particle amplitudes, as we know, is something that we have very good control over. So what can this part possibly be? So A hat three has three momenta S and K and the momentum PKS. It's going to be some coupling which can be different for different k's. So I'll give it a subscript k. Then times s square bracket with k to some power x1, k p, I'll drop the subscripts on p just to keep it simple. And then p hat s to some power x3. And we know from last time from our little group scaling that the x's depend solely on the helicities of the free particles involved. just the way a free particle and a free point correlator is determined in CFTs. And we know also from last time that the mass dimension of the coupling is one minus the sum of the helicities. Now, in order to evaluate what each of these brackets are, I will need to know what uh, P hat is. And I'm happy to show you the calculation uh, in if there are questions about it afterwards, but for now, let me simply give you the answer. So one can show, and you can feel free to ask if you'd like to see the details, that um, p hat ks square bracket is equal to k minus z times xs divided by ks times s square bracket. 
Okay, one step at a time, we're almost there. So using that, we then have that SK hat is simply SK because the shift by an S square bracket just gives nothing when you dot in an, another S square bracket, square bracket. Then P hat with S will likewise give KS because you only pick up from the first piece. But in K with P hat, I eliminate the first piece, that one, and pick up minus Z times XS divided by KS, multiplied by square bracket KS that comes from this part here. So why did I compute these three square brackets? Well, because those are exactly the one that sit up here in our free particle amplitude. So now we can rewrite it. When I put all these pieces together, I know what my three particle amplitude is. I plug it in back up here and I use what my, new, what my denominator is. I will have derived, and I'll leave the algebra to you, I'll have to write the master formula. So let me write down what the result is once all things settle, it is the following, namely that the n plus one particle amplitude deformed in, in Z and epsilon is going to be equal to the sum from K equals one to N of GK times SK square bracket to the two HS minus a number that I'll call A and this A that sits here will be equal to the mass dimension of the coupling plus two times the helicity of the soft particle, whatever that might be. Then there's an angle bracket XS to the one minus A. Then there's my shifted Z dependent N particle amplitude that just came along for the right. There's a factor one over epsilon, a factor C to the A minus one, an angle S K to the two minus A, and then one minus Z over epsilon. And I'm going to need a little more space to write the last bit here, uh, times X K divided by S K. All right, and that's the whole thing. Plus of course, order epsilon zero. And that is then our master formula. Maybe it doesn't look very much like master, but now we can start having some fun with it. Okay, the first thing that you see in this formula is something that is a little curious. Namely, and actually maybe I should just pause for a second to see if anybody has questions. I have a question. Yes, Stefano. That Z parameter that we introduced seems to not be a physical parameter, right? Exactly. So how, how come that it this master formula, I guess, in when you actually compute some amplitude, you have to take the limit z to zero and then see the behavior of the of the amplitude when epsilon goes to zero. So you need yes. limit for z to zero first. Precisely. So so we were working in a regime where z was less than epsilon, much less than one. And now to get things like soft theorems, I want to take epsilon to zero. But in order to do this, of course, I also need to take C to zero in order to preserve this. And now we see something very awkward, namely that whenever A is greater than one, we're going to have poles in Z, poles at C equals zero. And, and as you said, Z was just an auxiliary variable. And we know that our, our amplitudes are only allowed to have poles where physical particles can be exchanged. In particular, it is certainly not allowed to have any kind of poles in some random variable C. So 
So particles, physical particles can be exchanged. So they're in particular not allowed to have poles at, in, in any kind of value of C, in particular not at C equal to zero. So this can I ask another question? Yes. Um, in the derivation of the master formula, uh, did where did you have to use that Z is less than epsilon? So the way we used it was that I'm interested in an epsilon going to zero limit. So I want to move these poles just a little bit away from zero, but in the limit where I take epsilon to zero, I need them to all go back to zero, basically. Okay. Does that makes sense. So, but but it, but in the derivation of the factorization, as Z and epsilon are actually are. They're completely arbitrary That's from that point question. of view. It's only at the poles they have a relationship. I'm very good. Okay, so I'm not allowed to have any poles, but in this formula, I have some sum over things that whenever A is positive, or, or sorry, is greater than, than one, I obviously will have poles. So the only way to resolve this is that somehow they're actually not poles, that what when I do the sum over all K, the residues of these one over C or one over C to some power poles must cancel. So it must be the resolution is that that the Z equal to zero poles must have vanishing residues. They can also be branch cuts, right? The what, sorry? They can also be branch cuts, right? Because there can't be any branch cuts because I'm just a tree level. No, no, but well, GK is always integer or? Uh, D, D, GK is just, uh, this is just a coupling. So well, then then A can be fractional, right? So A minus one could be, there is Z to the A minus one. Oh, in the oh um, no, it actually doesn't turn out to be fractional because the mass dimension of the coupling has to be a, a, an integer. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. And I, then I, even I if I have half integer spin, I have two times the spin of S. So I, I will take fermions to zero in these soft limits also, but there's a factor of two. So A is actually, this is this is an integer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Okay. So let's try to see what we get out of this. And, and these statements, these fancy foundational statements I made in the beginning, that gravity equivalence principle, so and those actually exactly will come out of the requirements that these residues at C equals to zero vanish. So it gives a very fundamental result. Okay, so we'll, we'll let's now apply the story. Okay, we'll start with soft photons. And very good. We thought it's soft photons. Photons couple canonically to things like electrons and other things. We're looking at canonical pop couplings. So I want to look at cases where my coupling has no mass dimension. So that is dimensionless. If I do a dimensionless thing here and my soft photons, I take the positive velocity one. That's what I, what I was focusing on all along. Then my A parameter is going to be zero plus two times the helicity. So A is two. And precisely now we're in the situation where my A n plus one hat has a one over C pole. Because A was two and I go back to my formula and here I see I get C to the first in the, in the denominator. So let's grab our formula here. Um, actually I will grab it so I can use it multiple times later. Here we go and see what it gives us. So here's our master formula. Okay, what do I get? So I have A equals two and I have HS equals one and I plug into here and I see that the vanishing of the, of the one over C divergence, that residue says that the sum of K equals one through N must be equal to whatever the coupling is of particle S, the soft photon to, to particle K times, well, two 
times hs minus a, that's two minus two, that gives me zero. So there's no square bracket, sk goes to the zero power. I have an xs angle bracket to the minus first, but in, that's independent of k, so that will go outside. I have this guy here evaluated at zero because I'm taking the residue at c equal to zero. And the epsilon, I'm just going to factor out. That doesn't matter. Well, I can write it. And then I have SK angle to the zero power. And I'm looking at the residue at C equal to zero, so I get times one. OK, all in all, what this implies is that what must vanish is that the sum from one to n of GK must be zero. That seems like a very innocent constraint. But what does it mean physically? It means that charge must be conserved. So this is exactly the statement of charge conservation. It says that whenever I have photons that couple minimally in the sense of zero coupling dimension to any kind of particles, whether they're electrons or muons or whatever they are, the charge associated with that coupling must be such that in a non-vanishing amplitude, they add up to zero. So that is exactly what the standard charge conservation uh, of electric charge says. So last time, mm -hmm. in the first lecture, we talked about symmetries. And I said, oh, if your Lagrangian has a global U1, then you get water identities for the amplitudes that satisfy you know, for charge conservation of that U1 charge. Here we're doing something different. We have no Lagrangians to refer to. We just use statements of locality and factorization. And we automatically get the statement that whenever you have photons, you have charge conservation. And that's pretty cool. So you kind of get it out of- uh, out One of question. Way. Yes. Uh, how did you get rid of the A hat K? It depends on K, right? Well, it depends on K, but it depends on K in a very, in a very innocent way. So you're asking about this part here, that when I set mm -hmm. C to zero, um, there can't be anything in this case in that remainder of the amplitude that depends on K. It's basically just the same amplitude that we'll get when I take the amplitude and I remove my photon, it's whatever is left. So, so as long as this part is non-zero, it will be the same for all K and factor out of the sum. But that, that's a good question if there can be loopholes there, but, but in this case, there cannot. Okay. So now we have charge conservation. We got that for free. That's kind of nice. Of course, we knew that should happen, but it, it's nice to see it from, the, from this context. Then, well, what happens is that the order C to the zero terms, those are the ones that will give the soft theorems. And so let me show you how that works for the, for the photons. So now I look at terms in this expression that are the order z to the zero type terms. And I see that in order to get those, I have to take this numerator factor, sorry, this denominator factor, and I'm going to expand it in small z. So what will happen then is that the z that comes from here cancels the z that came from there and I'm left with a one over epsilon squared term. So I get something, let's write it as an arrow, that depends on one over epsilon squared. And then I have to see what else I get. I basically have all the same factors as before, but now they get multiplied by something else, namely the factors that came from this expansion here. So I have my one over xs, that came from this piece here to the minus one. And then I have the two factors from here. So they give an X K divided by an S K. And that multiplies a N evaluated at C equals zero. So it's no longer shifted. So that means that it's just a N. And again, in this case, just as before, there's actually no K dependence. And what this is, Oh, and I forgot my GK and then my sum. Let me get those in. So I have my sum over K, one through N and GK. And this is exactly the thing that I called the soft factor from before. So this derives us for us the leading soft theorem. 
And then you can get the subleading soft theorem with S1 by taking another way you can get an order C to the zero term is to expand the amplitude here. So you can get C times DC of AZ hat evaluated at C equal to zero. And that will give you the soft theorem. So this comes with some factor that depends on this. And that is related to the fact that there's actually a derivative operator that corresponds to the angle momentum operator that sits in those soft, subleading soft factors. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, so maybe this is just a coincidence, but that's why I'm wondering. So is it always the case that, or the, uh, that when you look at the, um, the residue uh, for Z, that you end up with some kind of symmetry statement? Um, in, in a sense, um, you will see another statement that you'll get soon, but it, but it, it actually is, is the case that you end up with something that is an amplitude consequence of a symmetry. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Can All right. Remind, can you, can you yes. remind what is X? Ah, X was what actually came from the polarization vectors that had the gauge freedom and polarization vectors. So X, X is basically epsilon. So in the traditional way, no, X is not, well, mm, no. Uh, okay, so, so in this derivation, the X came in through this arbitrary shift I did of the momentum variables. Okay, fine, good. So it just looked at like a totally arbitrary thing that I put in. Mm -hmm. But when I, when I told you in the beginning what the soft factors were in spinner helicity, uh, let me find it right here then X came in as the arbitrary gauge, the, the gauge freedom in the polarization vectors. That was this X, it turns out to be Oh, exactly. that's right, I, I remember now, thank you. So, so it's kind of cool that in this arbitrary shift where I just introduced it as a convenient way of moving the poles off from epsilon equal to zero, I had some arbitrary parameter that actually gets connected to the arbitrary choice of the arbitrariness and the choice you have of polarization vectors. That's a very nice connection there. Cool. Okay, soft gravitons. So here, a positive velocity graviton has H plus two. And what is the coupling dimension I should have for gravity? We saw that last time when we calculated the free particle um, graviton amplitudes. That's the dimension of, of kappa. So this should, this should be minus one. And so when I do this, I find that my A is minus the coupling dimension plus two times the helicity, and that is then a three. Okay, so, I, yes. Can I ask a follow-up question about the previous one? Sorry, I had some problems with the mic. I wanted to know, um, but it seems like your result depends on X, but X is an arbitrary choice. So why is that the case? So in my polarization vectors um, for photons, I had something that looked like um, X, uh, sorry, X sigma bar P for the photon, which is in this case X, S. And it looks like that. So there was some expression that looks like this. And what that was equivalent to so is changing X corresponds so shifting the polarization by something proportional to P. So that is that kind of gauge freedom that you have in your choice of polarizations. In other words, your polarizations have to have some normalization condition and they have to be transverse to the P's. But other than that, you have a freedom in choosing them. And that's a gauge freedom that sits there. Yeah, my, my question was just, that that pool that you found that uh, with a soft theorem that that one over epsilon square term isn't that a physical quantity that shouldn't depend on x on the choice of x? Well, yes and no, but it depends on the polarization vectors. But it, it's it's a universal factor, and you can write it in in the in the sort of non spin helicity form, but it has a dependence on the polarization vector. And I'm free to choose that polarization vector. I can shift it around. I can do different things with it, and that's basically what x encodes. Okay, so gravity. Now let's get our master formula back into the game again. We'll squeeze it down a little bit in size. And now we have A equals to three 
So we're even in worse shape. Now we have a one over C squared and we have to calculate its residue. And so what is it? We want the residue to be zero. So we take our sum over K equals one through N and now we have uh, A equals three and HS equals two. So what do we get? We get whatever the coupling is times SK now and this will be to the first power because it's four minus three that sits up here in this part. We get a factor which is xs to the minus two, that doesn't matter, that goes outside the sum. We get our amplitude an evaluated at zero. And then we have um, epsilon, we have c squared. Well, it's the residue I'm computing, so there's no z. And then I have sk here to the minus first. And this part here doesn't contribute anything at the leading Z uh, pole. Okay, so what this means is that the condition for getting a zero residue is that the sum K equals one through N of GK becomes SK times KS. That has to be zero. The other factors don't depend on K and I can get rid of them. But this is momentum conservation. This is basically PK, dotted in with some S's. So if it happened to be that, that so, so this has to hold for generic momentum. And so this can only hold, and it will hold by momentum conservation provided that all the couplings are exactly the same and they're present and non-zero for every K. So in order for this to hold, so this will hold, by momentum conservation, if and only if all the GK are the same, and we know what that same is, it's kappa. So the physical statement here is that the graviton must couple with the same coupling K to all other particles, in particular here, all other massless particles. And that is the amplitude's version of saying the equivalence principle that no matter what an object is made of, is it will drop the same in a gravitational field. So that is the equivalence principle that comes up. You could have imagined perhaps that a graviton coupled in a different ways to, to a fermion or something like that, but this shows you that that's simply not allowed. And that's the equivalence principle. Then you can go ahead and you can look at the order C to this. Oh, actually, I should make it make one more step, which is looking at the one over C term. Once you have the equivalence principles, there's no further constraints. And I'll leave it as an exercise to see that. And then from order C to the zero, you get this graviton soft factors. And again, that is a nice little exercise to see how that works. Questions? You, you have about six minutes left. Got it. Okay. Um, sorry. Yes. Um, can you, from this master formula, also derive the J tildes and yes tildes, or are those more complicated? Exactly. Yes, you can. So the um, the S tilde one for the photon soft theorem, and the S curly S tilde two for the graviton theorem, they come from higher derivative operators. So that means um, instead of having the massless coupling for photons or the dimension minus one coupling for the graviton, you look at higher derivative contributions and they are the ones that contribute to those. Um, so these comes from um, higher derivative terms. Can I ask something? Yes. Um, so you're working exclusively with massless particles here. So does this equivalence principle only hold for coupling of gravity to massless particles? No, you know that that gravity also couples the same to 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 massive particles. Um, it's a it's a statement that basically says that gravity couples with energy, as you can tell from this part here. This this part here is really pks squared, which is the center of mass energy, 
for S and K together. So, so you can see that it holds in that sense. And for massive particles, you just also have the mass that it couples to not just its kinetic energy, um, but the equivalence of hold, holds too, but I can't access massive stuff when I'm just inputting. Right, so it doesn't I mean, this does not cover that. It just does not cover that case. So. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to show you in the remaining four minutes is the statement I made in the beginning about what about higher spin. So I'll just do an example. So the example goes like this. Suppose that I have some spin-free particle. The equivalence principle would tell you that it must couple to spin two in some way. So say that I have some spin three particle and it couples to my graviton. And let's suppose we can think it couples to some other particle X, but let's just say that it couples to a negative velocity spin three. Let's suppose you have such an interaction. Doesn't seem to be much wrong with that. I know what the mass dimension of such a coupling would be because that's given by the free particle spin of helicity, bootstrap of the amplitude of three point. And it's one minus the sum of the helicity. So one minus three plus three minus two, that gives me minus one. And spin H, if I want to consider the spin three particle soft, it has three. So my A is now going to be minus one plus two times spin three, and that gives me five. It turns out that you can consistently prove that A cannot be four or greater, that doesn't exist. Uh, but that's a more general argument. Let me just present it for this case, why this is ruled out. Looking at our master formula, we have Z to the A minus one, that gives a one over Z to the four pole. Sorry, I put question. Yes. You said A cannot be greater than four? Right. Or less than? It, it cannot be greater than four. Okay. So in, in, if I knew that already, if I had proven that to you, then I can already rule out this case, but I'm just gonna show how this case is ruled out. Okay, I see, thank you. Okay, so if I go ahead and I, and I use the formalism from our master formula, let me just tell you what uh, the condition from Renison residue is. And that is that zero would have to be the sum over k equals one through n of gk sk xs to the minus four. We don't really care about that part, divided by sk to the minus three. That's what you would directly get times a n at c equal to zero. And generically, there's nothing that is like momentum conservation. There's nothing that, that, that helps me in any way here because the powers of the angle SK and the square SK don't match up. So generically, there's no way I can make this zero. So there's just no way I can tune the couplings, which is all I have to play with as numbers or do anything else that can make this zero. So this is generically always non-zero. And therefore I can conclude that spin three, massless spin three, cannot couple to spin two via an interaction of this form here. And so, of course, you could say that's that's not so powerful. You just showed me one particular coupling, but you can do this much more systematically and prove that higher spin can't be there. This was just one example of it. And it really relies on the fact that you can never get rid of the residues of the Z's. And so the last thing you could do is to consider spin three halves. And it turns out that from that, you will necessarily conclude that you, these particles must, these gravitinos must cap coupled to gravity in the super symmetric way. So you get another symmetry out of the uh, C vanishing Z residues, which is the SUSI water identity, super symmetric water identities. So if anybody's interested, I'm happy to, to share some notes on that. But for now, I think I, I'll stop and see if there are questions from today's lecture. Thanks, Henrietta. Well, I have a question. And uh, this may be naive, but I'm just confused about something. So in gauge theory, the gluon couples with the same coupling to every particle. We don't call that equivalence, right? Um, I mean, because it's not a statement about inertia. 
Does it cover? It's just a statement of gauge. Uh, it's just a sta uh, statement of gauge. It's a special statement of gauge sym symmetry right. in a sense. Um, but but I, I yes. So so wouldn't I technically have some freedom in how I set up? So of course the gluons will have to couple to themselves in a way that's dictated by by gauge invariance. Um, so say in forty n equals four, there's a whole bunch of particles, but just a single coupling. That's right. And there's no principle of equivalence. But if, over if, there. if I give up on the supersymmetry part. Um, Am I not allowed to have different quarks couple in different ways to gluons? Um, There's I mean, you couplings so, that are different, so the, but the gauge so coupling the, is I mean, one. That's right. The gauge coupling, yeah, you're right. I mean, the gauge coupling is one. I mean, it, it's sort of captured by the fact that I have FABCs all over the place. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, so yes, we don't call that the equivalence principle, but but you also have an important fact in in, Q, in QCD or in, in Yang-Mills theory, which is that the, the gluon doesn't have to couple to everything. And that's the difference, right? So, so what the statement here was that I could only get the pole to vanish when this entire sum was here, because I needed that every term here to use momentum conservation. So graviton must couple to every possible particle in the spectrum. But for the gluon, I can certainly have Yang-Mills theory, and I can have some electrons in it that are not charged under the non-abelian symmetries, that are just singlets, and the gluons don't touch them, they don't couple to them. So it is different from gravity in that respect. I see. Uh, I had a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, when you were discussing the, soft the master formula for soft photon, um, do we, can we use that to also describe soft gluon theorem? Uh, yes, yes, you can. And then we um, don't have to worry about any color ordering or anything. So, so when you do the soft gluon theorem, and that comes back to the exercise that we did before, if I'm looking at a gluon amplitude with some particular color ordering, Then because of the color ordering, the sum over K gets reduced to a sum of who the soft particle is adjacent to. So in that case, if I just wanted to extract the soft particles, I would only need to worry about S next to one, and then the rest of that, plus S next to N, and the contribution to that. Because of the color ordering, that's the only thing it's adjacent to and can attach to in this manner. With color ordering, I'm not allowed to cross lines or interchange the labels. So from this point of view, it just reduces the sum. It some, some basically means the same master formula, but some GK is automatically zero. Um, and, and this is the sum of these two contributions is what you need to do the first exercise I mentioned earlier on the lecture, connect these type of diagrams with stations to what you get from the soft limit of Pop Taylor. So there's a paper on the sub leading. So the gluon uh, sub leading soft theorem that was done shortly after the paper by Cachasso and Strominger for gravitons uh, by uh, Eduardo Casali. So that's a paper where you can look that up. So it's a very short paper. For this for this test. Um, another question I had. So I have seen that. I mean, you discussed the soft theorem and the subleading soft theorem, but I have also seen people discussing sub subleading soft theorem. Yes. So, is there a limit to that? How far we can go uh, from uh, the amplitude perspective? Yes. So, uh, let me go back to where I wrote these general formulas in the beginning. Uh, right here. So, so, so for the graviton, there's the the leading soft theorem, the subleading and then the sub-sub leading soft theorem. And you can see from the master formula that that's all you can have in terms of divergent limits in epsilon. The things that are order epsilon don't necessarily have any kind of universal form. And that's, that's the key difference. Um, so so an, one of the reasons we studied this in the first place in 2016 was the question of whether higher derivative operators could possibly change these soft factors. 
which came from the question of whether higher whether these soft limits would also be universal, these subbleeding and sub subbleeding soft theorems would also be leading with be universal in, in loop amplitudes because these were tree level results. And, and I mentioned all this before, but, but a subtlety at loop level is the IR divergences that arise in the loop calculations. But you could restrict yourself to a simpler context, which is the case where you get loop correction from massive particles. Those loops from massive particles, I could integrate out the massive particles by taking them very massive and ask what kind of effect that leaves in terms of effective operators. And so that's actually why we sat down and studied in generic effective field theory do these soft theorems change at all? And somehow nobody had ever asked those questions before. And it turns out that for photons, it can lead this, it can change the subleading soft theorem. And in graviton, it's only at sub subleading order. And this was quite important because in these celestial amplitudes and asymptotic symmetry approaches, the subleading soft theorem played a very important role for connecting things to the to the BMS algebra. And it would seem that the universality and, and the ideas that there could be some kind of flat space 2D holography at null infinity, that that would rely on these theorems at subleading order not to be corrected. And so it was actually quite important to be able to prove that at subleading order in the soft graviton theorems, there can't be any corrections from loops of massive particles at least. But there can be at sub subleading order where it plays less of a role. Um, there are papers by Ian Stewart at MIT and collaborators that look at massless loops. But again, you have the issue there of IR divergences built into the story. So you have to figure out what object you're actually going to look at. What is the physical object that you're, you're studying? Sorry. Um, and if, if, we, if we want to go even uh, higher up in the order, then we would have to anal analyze higher powers of, or uh, higher poles of Z, right? Yes. Oh, there was. So good, there, yes, sorry, what did you ask? Um, so I, I was just asking if we want to go even higher up in the order of, of these corrections, then we would have to look at uh, higher order poles of Z. Yes, I mean, I, I but that's not so much the that... stumbling block. The, the stumbling block is that once, when I look at the master formula, I had control over all the epsilon poles because they came from this uh, picture of moving all those poles that contribute away from the origin, but it leaves all the order epsilon to the zero term that I in generically don't have any control over. So you could try for specific amplitudes to write down answers for specific couplings, but it's not clear that there's a universality in the same way that there is for the divergent terms. Okay, so, so that would depend on the specific uh, way this, this A and amplitude look, and we have to go case by case for that. Right. So by the way, there's also in the chat a nice comment on the question about this equivalence principle in QCD's question. So Ethan, Neil comment and that quarks could be charged on the different representation of the gauge group, of course. And, and Thomas said the effective couplings could be different and so on. So, so, there, there, so anyway, so the, the gluons are not at the same level as the gravitons in terms of equivalent principles as, as we can conclude. Great, yeah, I get that now. So, um, so the last lecture tomorrow will be about the double copy. So we'll use what we know about poles and factorization again, and try to figure out how double copy and such a thing can even possibly work. And uh, that will be the subject for tomorrow. Okay, great. Sounds good. Um, let's thank Henrietta again. Uh, and maybe if people want to ask questions, you can hang out here or go together. <laughs>